So hello and welcome everyone to our September program, So You Want to Get Divorced, Now What? Uh, joining us tonight is Christopher Fanning from Sean's Fanning, and I am going to let him take it from here and uh, talk about himself and what this program is about. Okay, thank you, Amy. Uh, yeah, as Amy said, my name is Chris, Chris or Christopher Fanning, and I am a divorce and family law attorney practicing uh our office is in Hillsboro, but we kind of cover all over Oregon. We're in Washington County primarily, but we also do Multnomah County, Clackamas County, um, Columbia County, Yamhill County, um, you know, that general region. Um, you can see our uh, information there is uh, www.oregondivorceattorney.com if you want to look us up. But uh, I am a family law attorney who's been practicing for 12 years. Uh, the majority of that time has been exclusively in family law. Um, and uh, I wanted to thank the Washington County Law Library for putting on these programs, um, particularly this one, because I think it's really important um, to kind of dispel some of the myths and misunderstandings about a divorce. One of the, you know, one thing that I really like when I'm meeting a new person who's getting a going through this process um, is the feeling that, you know, they'll go from being uncertain about what's going on and, and being unclear and then having a conversation with them. And within the span of, you know, 30, 40 minutes, they will suddenly feel like, well, maybe things aren't going to be perfect, but at least I have a better understanding of what's going on. Um, so uh, I want to say at the beginning that I am not providing legal advice. It's not intended to be legal advice for anyone. It's just kind of uh, an overview of the process and not intended as recommendations for anyone's specific uh, personal situation. So if you have questions about your uh, specific case, um, you should speak with your own attorney uh, to talk about the specifics of that situation. If you want to call me up and schedule a time for us to talk, um, assuming that there are no conflicts, I would be happy to go into greater detail with you about your situation. Um, so with that said, um, See if I can get this to work. Great. All right. So the things I wanted to kind of talk about tonight, I, I think of it as three kind of broad topics. First is the process. Um, you know, uh, how do you get from A to Z in this process? The second is the cost spectrum where, you know, it's the way I like to think of it is there's the cheapest way to get things done. And then there's the most expensive way to get things done. Um, but it helps to know the process a little bit before you get to that. And then finally, uh, maybe a quick overview of some of the potential issues that you may or may not be facing uh, in your divorce. Um, so that's just kind of an outline of where we're going to be going. Um, so the process, uh, what do you need to get a divorce in Oregon? Uh, well, first, I want to start with what you don't need. You don't need to have infidelity. You don't need to have physical abuse, emotional abuse. You don't need to show that there's been a lack of affection. You don't need to show that somebody's got a mental illness or a substance abuse problem. Um, you know, you don't need to show that somebody secretly has a crush on some celebrity and it really hurts your feelings. You don't need any of that. Oregon is what we call a no fault state. That means that you don't have to come in and prove a reason uh, for why you want to have a divorce. You don't have to show um, any of the things that were on the previous slide. All you have to show or allege is that they, you have irreconcilable differences with your spouse. Um, that can be pretty much anything. And you don't have to get into the details or really give an explanation to a court other than to say you have irreconcilable differences. Um, Basically, the only reason that you have to give is that you want to get a divorce, okay? I like to think of it as, you know, you have a right to be married, but you also have a right to not be married. Um, so you don't have to necessarily get into negative or unpleasant things that may have happened during your relationship. Um, so don't, uh, you know, think of that as some kind of barrier that's out there. There are some jurisdictions and, you know, it was this way in the past where, yeah, you had to have more of an explanation, but these days, at least in Oregon, you just have to say reconcilable differences. That could be over 
um, how you're raising your kids. It, it could be over the way you brush your hair. It doesn't matter. Uh, the other thing that you do need is you have to have, one of you has to have lived in Oregon for six months before you file your case. That's just a jurisdictional requirement. Um, every state has their own version of it, but Oregon is six months. So if you've lived here for six months and you have irreconcilable differences, you can get a divorce. Um, so that gets us to kind of the actual meat and potatoes of, of this process, right? Um, the first step, if you're looking to get a divorce, is you would file a petition. Uh, that is the initiating document. I think it's really important for you to, for people to know that a petition is just a request for relief, okay? It's your way of saying to the court, I would like a divorce and this is what I would like to happen in the divorce. That's not necessarily what will happen. It's just uh, a request, okay? You don't have to list every single asset that you have. You don't have to have a specific amount of spousal support. You don't have to have a whole child support calculation. Uh, you don't have to you know, have a bunch of information. You can keep it very general. You can say, uh, I would like to be awarded spousal support. I would like to be awarded child support. I would like a just and equitable division of our assets. Uh, and I'd like a parenting plan that's in our kids' best interest. So um, sometimes people will get hung up on thinking that they need to spell out every detail of their divorce or say, I don't know enough about our assets to do anything. Well, to get the thing, to get your divorce started, you don't need to know all of those things. Uh, you may need to know them down the road, but we'll get there. Um, once, uh, I should say there are a number of other documents that go with the petition, but they're kind of long and boring and, um, you know, about confidential information that you have to file with the court. Um, there's a um, statistics form that you have to file with the um, Oregon Health Authority and things like that. But we always kind of think of them more as opening documents and then shorthand it to just the petition. Um, so once you have a petition and you've filled it out and you have filed it with the court, the court assuming that it, the court accepts it, um, you then have to uh, serve it on the other party. Um, that normally requires that there be personal service. Uh, oftentimes you can have the sheriff do it, but it could also be a private process server. Um, those options both cost a little bit of money, uh, you know, a relatively small fee, but it is part of the process that the other side has to be served. But you don't have to use the sheriff. You don't have to use a private process server. It really just needs to be somebody who's not a party to the case, who's over the age of 18. Um, so it could be a friend, it could be a, a, a parent, a sibling. As long as they're not a party to the case, meaning they're not getting divorced, um, and they're over the age of 18, they can personally serve the other party. Um, personal service is uh, one of the most common ways, but there are a number of other ways that you can accomplish service. You can have the other party agree to accept service, meaning that they will take the documents and sign an acceptance of service that says, okay, I've received everything. Um, that would then need to be filed with the court, uh, but it saves you maybe some time, money, hassle. Um, you can also do alternate service. There's ways to serve people at their work. There's ways to, uh, you know, serve them at their own, their, through the mail and other things like that. But they are rather complicated and um, there's a lot of different rules. So I'm not going to try to go into those because they're, they are complicated and um, you just want to make sure that it's done right. Um, so let's not start off down that road. If you're thinking that you need to go that route, talk to an attorney. Um, once the person has been served, you file a proof of service with the court. This is basically a sw sworn statement that says that the other side was served with the documents. Uh, that's an important date because once they are served, they have 30 days to file a response to the petition. Um, the response is kind of just what it sounds like. It's the other side responding to the allegations or requests that were made in the petition. So you have a petition, then you have a response. Uh, it can be very general. Again, it can be very specific. You can add counterclaims like saying, well, I want spousal support or I want custody or I want you know, the other side to pay my attorney fees or, or whatever you wanna make a counterclaim for. 
Um, you know, again, you don't have to get super specific, but it is important to make sure you list what you want because if you don't ask, you can't get, okay? Um, the rules are a little confusing about this, but, uh, you know, we say you have 30 days to file a response. It's a little misleading because it's not like at the 30th day or the 31st day, rather, the court's like, okay, well, this person's been served. It's been 31 days. We're going to now do something in the case. They, they have uh, a little bit too much going on to be tracking everything like that. And honestly, cases, you know, sometimes there are reasons like the attorneys and the parties are trying to work it out. So they don't want to file a response right away. But um, if someone does not file a response within 30 days, you do have the option of potentially pursuing a default against this person. Um, basically, what that means is if they have not filed a response, you can say, hey, court, I should win by default because they didn't show up. It's another way of saying, you know, I'm here, I'm ready to to, to play, and the other team forfeited. Um, so... Um, that is its whole other process that you would probably want to at least speak with an attorney about, and I'm not going to get into the specifics of it, but you, you know, it's going to depend on the certain cir circumstances. Um, but that is an option, just so that people know that if a response is not filed, it's not like the other side can just sit there and thumb their nose at you, and there's nothing you can do about it. The law does provide for that. So um, the next thing. So once a case has been initiated. Uh, I always like to think of the kind of the next phase that may or may not be there uh, as the temporary relief phase. Um, the reality is that a divorce can take a very long time. Um, the courts are going to do the best they can, but there's only so many hours in the day. There's, uh, you know, plenty of divorces to go around. So sometimes it can take a long time before you can get to court. And there may be emergencies or there may be urgent matters uh, that need to be addressed and can't wait until everybody's had a chance to dive through everybody's bank statements and things like that. So the law does allow for different types of emergency or temporary relief. Um, these are not always necessary. They don't happen in every case, but it is available um, if a party needs it. Um, the types of relief um, can include things like asking for temporary custody of your children or a temporary parenting plan to establish some kind of visitation schedule with the children. Um, it could be temporary spousal support so that one party can support him or herself while the case is going. Um, it could be temporary child support so that they have money to support the children during, uh, you know, the divorce process. Um, there are things like immediate danger orders. That's where if uh, a child is in a situation where he or she may be in danger, uh, the court has a process so that you can get an, uh, an emergency order to protect the child. Um, there's also things like status quo orders. That's a uh, another type of order that uh, is, it's, uh, you know, kind of like an emergency relief uh, where if there's concern that one parent's going to take the other parent and not allow them to see, uh, or sorry, one parent's going to take the child and not let them see the other parent, then they can um, get like a status quo order. And basically that says, hold on, while everything um, is going forward with this divorce, or at least until further order of the court, we're just going to keep things the way that it's been for the 90 days before uh, the person went to get that kind of order. Um, you can also ask for things like exclusive use of, of a residence. Um, you know, if there are, if there's a lot of conflict between the parties or if there's, um, you know, need for people to be separated from each other, um, you can try to get exclusive use of the residence on a temporary basis. Um, you can also ask for suit money. That's a, uh, request where you'd be asking the other side to give you money to help you pay for an attorney to represent you. Um, there are just kind of any kind of temporary relief that you may need. You can potentially ask the court for it. And, um, you know, there's going to be different standards about whether or not you're entitled to it. 
you know, each issue is going to have its own legal standard and it's going to depend on the circumstances, but that is um, uh, an avenue that's out there. So how would you go about getting a temporary order or an emergency order? Well, that's going to depend on uh, the type of relief you're requesting. So what I could say is it's going to be best to work with an attorney to, to get those filed if you're thinking that you need temporary uh, or emergency relief. You may just get help filling out the paperwork, but each one has its own process. And, and I just don't have time to go through every little nuance of each one. Um, but generally what you would be doing is filing a motion for either emergency relief or temporary relief. Uh, with that motion, you would be filing a declaration. Now, the motion is basically you requesting the relief, and then the declaration is basically evidence, okay? It's it's a sworn statement, so it's like testimony. You're swearing to the court um, that what you're putting in that declaration is true, and it supports your request. Um, because it's like testifying, you need to make sure that what you're saying is accurate and truthful. Um, and so... If you file a motion and a declaration, you uh, may also need to file an order, like an order to show cause. Um, that's usually for temporary relief where you'd be saying, uh, you know, the court is basically ordering the other side to show up and show cause why you shouldn't be awarded the temporary relief that you're seeking. Um, but, uh, you know, emergency orders, they may not have a hearing like that. They'll just kind of order it and you still have the right to have a hearing after the order has been entered. But um, like I said, they, they, they're all different and they all kind of have their different complications. So um, it really would be best if you're looking for one of those orders to at least discuss it with an attorney and, and get some guidance. Um, but know that there is temporary relief available because I've you know, spoken with many people, they're like, well, what am I going to do while all this is going through? I need money and and so-and-so won't give me the money. Well, temporary relief may be an option. It just depends on the circumstance. Okay, so um, the next phase, uh, you know, and I should say that these are going to overlap a bit um, because it's not like you have to do this before you can move on to that. Some of these things are all happening at the same time. And one of those is the discovery phase, or at least what I call the discovery phase. Um, this, uh, you know, basically with every case, there's going to be a lot of facts and there's going to be a lot of information that needs to be gathered um, that's needed. So uh, the parties can evaluate the case. They can evaluate its strengths, its weaknesses, uh, and prepare them to, you know, maybe have settlement discussions or if they have to go to trial, prepare for that trial. Um and so this discovery phase is where you're gathering all the documents and all the information that you may need. Um, there's a number of different discovery tools that are available. Uh, in every divorce, there are mandatory disclosures. Um, there's, that basically means there are certain documents that both parties must furnish to each other because it is required by statute. Specifically, the statute is ORS 107.089. Uh, the documents that you are required to disclose include, but, you know, there's more than this, but it includes uh, income tax returns. It includes income records for periods where taxes haven't been filed. Um, that may just be the current calendar year. Um, it includes documents related to any assets that you have or debts that um, you own that could include uh, mortgages. It could include credit cards. It can include any kind of debts. Um, it includes documents related to your house or any real estate that you may own. It includes bank statements, documents related to vehicles that you may own, investment accounts, retirement accounts, all along all assets and liabilities that you may own. Um, they're not perfectly covered by the mandatory disclosures, uh, but they are going to need to be uh, shared at some point so that you don't run the risk of uh, potentially being accused of hiding something during the divorce. Beyond the mandatory disclosures, um, you know, oftentimes attorneys will send out what are called requests for productions of documents. Um, I will usually send a request for production 
uh, that mirrors the mandatory disclosure, but then has a bunch of other stuff that isn't in the mandatory disclosure. And I'm not alone in that. A lot of attorneys do that. Um, in a request for production, uh, an attorney can ask for anything. Um, you know, whether or not they get it is another question, uh, but they can ask for anything that may reasonably lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. Um, usually, uh, we're looking for assets and documents related to assets, but we might also be looking for communications or school records or social media profiles or attempts to find work or anything else that may be related to any of the number of the issues that would be in the divorce. Um, admittedly, this process is going to seem uh, intrusive. And I don't think I've had a, a request for production that I had to discuss with the client where they didn't tell me that they thought uh, a good portion of it was unnecessary. And sometimes it is, and you, you know, you deal with it accordingly, but um, it is the reality of divorce that you are kind of uh, putting your life out there, uh, at least for the other party to see, maybe for the other party, their attorneys, and who knows, who knows who else. Um, so that's, it, it just really is kind of the reality of the divorce. Um, both sides have to do it. Uh, it's not like one side is getting picked on, although when you're the one that has to be gathering all your documents, you'll probably feel like that. Um, but both sides do have to do it. So, you know, it's something to be aware of, um, that just because they request documents from you, um, that doesn't mean they don't have to provide anything. I hear that all the time. Like, are we going to ask for all this stuff? And usually the answer is, well, we already did. And, and <laughs> so um, just be aware that it, it's it's not completely one-sided. Now, it may if you're the one that has all the documents and the other side doesn't have anything, it's probably going to feel like you're the one doing all the work. But that may be the, the, the price of being the responsible person. Uh, or at least the one who was responsible for it during your marriage. Um, when you're served with a request for production, you need to respond to that. Um, you can send objections. Um, there's all sorts of things uh, that you can object to, like if they're trying to uh, violate attorney-client privilege, or if they're, uh, you know, trying to get into medical records that may not be relevant, or if they're uh, asking for 40 years worth of text messages, although, the, the, I mean, I guess there aren't 40 years worth of text messages, but, you know, text messages from the time you were dating and you've been married for 10 years, probably going to be, you know, first, probably not going to have it, but beyond that, it's probably going to be uh, overly burdensome and undiscoverable. Um, there can really be a lot of benefit in working with an attorney to respond to these requests for production um, so, again, I'll give a plug to attorneys because um, if you've ever just received a request for production, you see everything that's listed and uh, it may seem really overwhelming. What I like to do is when I get those, I sit down and I talk with my client and we go through it one by one and uh, I will answer their questions and I will say, um, you know, well, see if you can get that. Or, if you know, a lot of times people will be like, I don't have any of this stuff. Well, that may seem like a big deal to them. And to me, it's pretty simple. Oh, you don't have it? Well, then you don't have it. You can just move on. Um, so I think working with an attorney, there is a benefit from that. Um, you should be aware that if a request for production has been made, the other side has 30 uh, to 45 days to respond. It just kind of depends on when the request was sent out. Um, and if they don't provide those, there can be motions uh, for to compel the discovery and there can be motions for sanctions and other things. So um, just be aware that that is out there too if somebody is not responding to your request for production or if you're not responding to a request for production, that may be coming your way. Um, I would also say that taking time to respond to those requests for production can really slow down the resolution of your case, uh, which will cost you time and will cost you money. So I know it's intrusive, I know it's a pain, but um, it's kind of like a Band-Aid. The sooner you get to it and just rip it off, uh, maybe the better it feels to just get that done. Um, in the discovery section, I've also included um, 
the uniform support declaration. Uh, that's kind of because I didn't really know where else to put it. Um, the, the uniform support declaration is a document uh, that is oftentimes requested by attorneys, but regardless, it is required by law in cases where spousal support or child support has been requested. Um, it's a document that provides all sorts of information related to a party's income uh, and their monthly living expenses and uh, anything that would really impact a spousal support um, determination or a child support calculation. Um, you know, they'll ask, it asks for things like income, the number of overnights you spend with your kids, if you have union dues, if you had child care expenses, all of that stuff. Um, each party is required to not only complete one, but also file it with the court. Um, and again, it is a sworn statement. So it's important that if you're completing that, that you be as truthful as possible. Um, so beyond uh, those types of uh, discovery uh, tools, there are things like depositions and requests for admissions and, and requests to inspect. Um, and honestly, these are available, but they're, they, they're kind of rare in family law cases. Uh, depositions um, can happen and are probably the most common out of those three, but honestly, um, they you know, are kind of reserved for the more complicated cases and they're not always necessary, um, but it is a tool that's out there. Um, that, you know, basically the way a deposition works is you would sit down and you'd be, well, whoever's being deposed would be sat down and sworn in um, and have to answer a series of questions by the attorney who is deposing them and give truthful answers. Um, they're not always financially practical in divorce cases, so don't be surprised if you don't have one in your case. Uh, requests for admissions. Uh, or it's a discovery tool where a party can ask the other side to admit things or deny things. Uh, you know, you might make a statement like, well, uh, the parties were married on January 1st, 2011. Okay. And you either admit it or you deny it. I don't know why you would spend the time uh, sending that kind of request for admission, but it's just an example. Um, and then there's things like requests to inspect for like requesting to inspect uh, a property if you want to have an appraisal done um, or to have any other kind of inspection done for, you know, to try to figure out information that you may need uh, for uh, preparing your case for trial. That can include having a valuation of a pension or using um, like a, doing like a forensic accounting of bank accounts to look at spending habits or to figure out the value of a business. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot. Um, and kind of put at the end, the discovery phase is really just like you researching and preparing your case. So that discovery phase might also include, uh, you know, working with experts, contacting witnesses, tracking down police reports, potentially, um, finding out, you know, what information is out there uh, that may help you tell your story and introduce evidence uh, that you wouldn't necessarily be able to introduce on your own. Um, all of that is part of the discovery phase. And it's important because it leads to the next phase, uh, which is, you know, settlement discussions. Uh, hey, Chris. Yeah. Real quick, we have a question in the q and I don't know if this is something you're getting to later. Um, I just wanted to point out to you that there is a question in there um, in case that is something that is answerable now or later. I will be getting to that in a minute. <laughs> so, um, yeah, anyway. Uh, so the next step in this process that I, you know, uh, at least in, in my kind of breakdown of it is the settlement discussions uh, and the purpose of gathering all the documents and the discovery and everything that we were talking about in the last slide. Uh, is so that you can get your case ready for resolution. Um, you know, you may still have to go to a trial uh, if you guys aren't able to work out a resolution, but a large number of cases, I would say the majority of them are resolved without the need for a trial because it's settled, right? Um, that means the parties have come to an agreement. They don't need 
uh, a third party to make decisions uh, for them because they came to an agreement and there's no longer a dispute. Uh, it's a preferable path for a number of reasons. One is you're going to save money. The longer you're working with an attorney, the more you're going to be paying that attorney. Um, you're also going to save time because, uh, you know, the reality is that, like I said, courts have a lot of cases. Um, they're very busy. And if you have to wait for trial, it's like waiting in line. Um, if you uh, are able to skip that line because you're able to come up with an agreement, you don't have to wait. Um, if you, well, the other thing you should be aware of, you know, just kind of the reality of trials is that if you're not able to get it done in one day, you may have to come back for a second day. So the more you hear this, hopefully the more you hear that settling your case uh, is a preferable path. In fact, you know, um, there, there was a judge who's now retired and, and one of the things he would do is if you were in his courtroom settling your case, he would give you a piece of chocolate and tell you good job because you just saved yourself money. Um, and it was a, it was a chocolate coin, so it looked like you were you know, it was money that you were getting. Um, you also save yourself a lot of emotional energy because uh, you know divorce is kind of like to me anyway, it's like an open wound. If it's not allowed to close and heal, then it's just going to keep getting worse and uh, it's going to keep hurting. Um, so being able to wrap it up is uh, to me preferable. Um, and finally, I think the most important thing is that if you are able to settle it, you are in control of the outcome. Um, you know, judges are going to do the best they can. Uh, they have a very difficult job. Um, but if you're asking them to re resolve your conflict, you're kind of stuck with them making a decision based on what they think is best. And and it's not that they're wrong, but that may not be what either of you want uh, or what either of you think is best. Um, but this is just kind of the way it is. If you leave your disputes to be resolved by a third party who you probably aren't going to know, and, you know, they may not have um, a ton of time to sort through everything. So uh, it's, you know, it's not a, an attack on judges. It's just kind of the reality of the situation that they're put in, uh, trying to resolve a conflict between two people that can't agree on something. Uh, I will say that many judges that I've talked to have said that they feel like they did a good job if they know that everybody's equally unhappy. So if you already know, you're, you're probably going to end up somewhat unhappy with the decision. Um, maybe save yourself some time and heartache by coming up with something that maybe you're not as unhappy with. Uh, and, you know, if both of you can live with it, it's preferable to just kind of I don't want to say leaving it up to chance, but leaving it in somebody else's hand. Um, so settlement discussions can take any number of uh, forms. It could be in the form of a settlement letter where, uh, you know, I might send a letter to the other side saying, hey, we're willing to agree to these terms. You know, so-and-so gets the house, they get these bank accounts, whatever. Um, and that may be enough. Somebody reads a letter like that says, yeah, that sounds good. And you have an agreement. Um, you may also go to mediation. Um, that is more of a it's, a, it's a scenario where two people are sitting there trying to resolve a dispute and there's a mediator, a third person in the middle trying to say, okay, uh, you know, let's see where we can find common ground. Um, I may be talking about this later, but, you know, mediation isn't, uh, it sometimes gets confused uh, with, like arbitration or being uh, in front of a judge. A mediator uh, is not making decisions for your case. They're just trying to help two parties uh, come to an agreement that they can both you know, live with. And if they can't do it, they can't do it. The mediator doesn't get to say, sorry, you're forced to do this because I'm the mediator and I say that. That's outside the scope of their uh, duty in the mediator role. Um, so you could do private mediation if you were to work with, you know, a private mediator who has their own mediation practice or business. Um, uh, or if you have custody or parenting time issues, uh, most counties, I know Washington County has this and, and Multnomah County and, and Clackamas County, they, they all kind of require the parties to go to mandatory mediation. Uh, again, that's just for custody and parenting time issues. Uh, but it is a requirement uh, that courts 
send out, send people out to do to see if they can work out parenting time and uh, custody issues uh, without the need for court time. Um, another kind of uh, settlement discussion that it's like mediation is a judicial settlement conference. Uh, you know, most courts have a requirement that you try to engage in some kind of alternative dispute resolution. Um, and that's just a fancy way of trying to settle, say of saying, that's a fancy way of saying, trying to settle your case without going to court. Um, and one option is like a judicial settlement conference. It's like a mediation, but instead of a private mediator, um, you might be using a judge. Um, in fact, you would be using a judge. That's why it's called a judicial settlement conference. Uh, and again, they wouldn't be able to just make decisions on the spot, but they're there to see if they can facilitate a conversation and, and work out an agreement between the two of you. Um, so yeah, those are some settlement, uh, some options for settlement discussions. And, uh, if you're able to settle it, awesome. If not, you move on to the next process, uh, or next step of the process, if it will go, which is the trial. Um, the trial, uh, is, you know, when people cannot resolve their, uh, differences they have to go to a trial uh, it's basically your chance to tell your story to the judge um, and argue why you think that your position uh, is why why the law supports your position um, things about trial is you will not have a jury we don't have juries in divorce cases it will just be a judge who's making a decision about the outcome um, it's not like a criminal case. You do not have a constitutional right to counsel. So you may end up having to represent yourself. Um, I, I unfortunately been there a number of times where somebody shows up and they said, well, I'm here to request an attorney. And it's like, well, today's the day for your trial. You don't have a right to an attorney. I guess you're just gonna have to wing it. Um, and it's unfortunate, but you should know now you don't have that right. Um, so if you think you're gonna need help, um, start looking for it well before you end up in trial. Um, so like I said, this is your opportunity to tell your story to the judge. Um, you start by making an opening statement. Um, generally, that's you saying that's what the evidence will show. The evidence will show the following. Uh, and whatever your story is, that's where you lay that out in your opening statement. But that's not evidence. That's just you kind of giving a foreshadowing of what the evidence will show. The evidence uh, phase is where, you know, you would be potentially calling witnesses or testifying yourself. Uh, you have the option of introducing exhibits, um, you know, uh, you know, providing testimony. That's basically you telling your story. Uh, it's not argument. It's, you know, fact based. It's supposed to be, um, you know, you saying uh you know i was standing on the corner and i saw the car run the red light right that's not an opinion that's a fact or at least your version of what happened so um yeah I, witnesses provide that testimony it can be you usually the parties uh end up testifying they may be the only witness uh, which is okay but there may be other witnesses there may be friends there may be experts there may be um any number of people that could provide helpful information to the court. Um, you know, when you're dealing with uh, witnesses, they are the kind of catalyst to help you bring in exhibits. Um, the exhibits are documents. Uh, they can be recordings. They can be physical items. Any kind of tangible thing that can help tell the story. Um, this could be you know, house appraisals, bank statements, pay stubs, text messages, emails, uh, work schedules, tax returns, all those things that you're gathering in discovery may someday be an exhibit in your trial. And witnesses help, you know, um, bring those in because they introduce them. They say, oh, yeah, this is a true statement uh, from my bank account as of this date. And, you know, that's how it because exhibits don't just magically appear. You have to have somebody kind of introduce them to the court um, and verify that they are true. Um, 
One thing I forgot to say about witnesses, and this is including you, if you are testifying at your trial, they are subject to cross-examination. So uh, if you end up testifying on your own behalf, uh, you may be in the position of being cross-examined by uh, another attorney or potentially your soon-to-be ex-husband or ex-wife um, because it is a procedural or you know a due process right that everybody has that you have the right to cross-examine their witnesses and they have the right to cross-examine your witnesses. Um, I, I say that just so that people know that it's out there and they're not surprised when it happens because... You know, as soon as a witness testifies, they are out there um, facing the possibility that they will be cross-examined. Um, I would say with witnesses and exhibits, it's really important to make sure that it is helpful to the court. That means you want to make sure that it is, you know, somehow tied to something that's important to your case. Um, if it's a picture of the two of you when you first met, and you're really sad about it, you know, that, that may not be terribly helpful to the court. It may not have anything to do with how much money either of you make or how good of parents you are or anything like that. Uh, it might, I don't know, talk to an attorney and, and get their opinion on it. Uh, but just make sure that if you are out there, whatever you're testifying about and whatever exhibits that you're introducing, try to make sure that it is being helpful to the court. Um, there are certain things that the court doesn't necessarily need to know. Um, for example, recently somebody asked, well, isn't 72 larger than 64? A court can do basic math. That's not helpful to the court to bring that kind of information in. Um, another piece of the evidentiary process is objections. Um, people uh, hear about objections. They know the phrase, I object, all that kind of things, uh, all those kinds of things. Um, and those are... It's a right that parties have to object to testimony or evidence or exhibits or anything uh, that they don't think is appropriate uh, to bring into a trial. Um, they can object, you can object. Um, and the thing is about objections is that lawyers spend a lot of time learning the rules of evidence because there are very specific rules about what you can bring in and what you can't bring in. Um, there are certain things that are legally impermissible to be included in the record. Uh, they may be because that may be because it's hearsay. It may be because it's irrelevant. Um, it may be because there wasn't a foundation that was laid to show that the document or the item is what the person says, or it could be that somebody's speculating. Um, it, it is not just, it is not appropriate to be objecting just because you don't like something. Right. Um, you know, I think it was John Adams. The facts are stubborn things. Right. Well, uh, sometimes you may not like a fact, um, but it's not appropriate to object to it just because you don't like it. Now, there may be some other reason why it's appropriate to object, um, but just be aware. I have many a time sat at, uh, you know, council table and had someone start telling me, uh, you know, uh, they can't say that, you know, that's not, you know, that's not true, this, that, or the other thing. And it's not appropriate for me to say, objection, they're not telling the truth. That's what, you know, cross-examination and your own ability to present evidence is for. So uh, if you uh, feel like you're going to end up representing yourself, maybe talk to an attorney and get some idea of what objections are. But again, it takes a long time uh, to learn the rules of evidence um so it, it it may be a little over your head to to just try to jump into it without uh an attorney just know that it is something you can do uh, but don't be objecting just because you don't like something um once everybody has presented all of their evidence including witnesses exhibits um uh, you know anything that they want the court to consider their case is considered closed or at least they're done with their presentation and then we move into the legal argument, oftentimes her, uh, described as closing arguments or closings, right? Um, it's an opportunity for each side to argue how the facts of their case relate to the law that the court must follow. Um, you can argue about 
uh, you know, whether documents support the outcome you want. You can try to argue about credibility of other side's witnesses. Um, and you can use it as an opportunity to make a request to the court for what you would like to have happen. Um, it, uh, I tend to think of a whole case as you're telling a story and then arguing why your story is the correct story that the court should believe and what they should do about believing their story. In that scenario, the evidence phase is you telling the story and the legal argument is you arguing why your story is correct. Um, once both sides have done their closing arguments, the judge will make a decision. Uh, they may say, I need some time to think about it and I will send out a written opinion, or they may make a decision right there uh, on the spot. It's going to depend on the circumstances of your case um, and you know that judge's particular practice. But um, that you know will be kind of the heart pounding moment now that you've presented all your evidence and you're sitting there waiting to hear what the judge says. And it could be nerve wracking, but um, it is part of the process. Um, once you have a judge's decision, that is not the end of the road. Then you need to prepare a general judgment. Um, this is the final document that you know, formalizes your divorce. It includes all the terms of whatever the court ordered or you guys agreed on um, or a combination of both. And it's basically kind of, I don't wanna say a contract, but it's a, a binding document that says, this is how everything is going to work, okay? Once it's signed by the court, you are officially divorced and now you are bound by the terms of that general judgment. Um, they can be prepared you know, by, you know, a judge may prepare it if there are no attorneys involved, but if there are attorneys involved, the judge is going to make one of the attorneys do it. Um, and there's a whole process for that where one attorney drafts it, the they have to give the other side the opportunity to respond to it. And if they have objections that they cannot resolve between the two of them, they may have to go back to court and have the judge tell them, fix it this way or that way. Uh, so that is kind of when people think, well, my divorce is done, uh, but I would argue that's not the end of the road. Uh, after a general judgment is entered, there are still a number of things that may come up. For example, uh, if you had to go through a full hearing or, or even if you just have some reason, you may file an attorney fee petition. Um, this is a, an opportunity to request that the other side pay your attorney fees. Um, you have to have uh, made sure that you requested that right or at least given them notice of your intent to seek attorney fees. Um, there is no guarantee that you will get your attorney fees. It's just like the petition uh, that started your case, a request. Um, there's a number of things that go into it. We don't have time to go into all the nuances of an attorney fee petition, but those usually come at the end of the case after a general judgment has been entered. Uh, beyond that, you will probably, well, you might have to separate a bunch of your assets. You may have bank accounts that you need to close down and divide up. You may have car titles that need to be signed over to somebody else. Uh, you know, you may have a house that needs to be sold. It just depends on what's in the general judgment. One uh, particular item, item that comes up for retirement accounts is what's called a quadro or a QDRO, which stands for Qualified Domestic Relations Order. This is a specific order that is used to divide retirement accounts without incurring tax penalties uh, or forcing uh, anybody to take a 10% penalty for an early withdrawal. Um, you need to have a special attorney to draft those um, and you have to go through a whole, uh, it's easier, but it's still a process to get the quadro done to make sure uh, that you comply with all the terms of the general judgment. You might also have to make sure that you make arrangements to set up support payments. That may be working with the Department of Justice uh, if they're going to be garnishing wages, or it might be just setting up some kind of uh, auto withdrawal. It just depends on your circumstances. Um, but it's just kind of my way of saying you're not done just because you have a general judgment uh, that's signed. You still have to do everything that was in that general judgment. And if it was really straightforward and simple, you may not have to do a lot, but it may be a lot of things that you have to do. Okay, um, that kind of spells out the process. And now I wanna get to uh, the question from the question and answer uh, section. 
uh, it's not going to be necessarily a direct answer, but this is the cost spectrum analysis that I talk about. Um, again, this is the uh, trying to answer the question, uh, one of the most common concerns, which is how much is all of this going to cost me? Okay. I like to think of it as the cheapest way to get divorced and the most expensive way to get divorced. So the cheapest way, if the parties have a full agreement, if there's no dispute about anything, you can do what's called a kitchen table divorce. Um, now, we just went through this whole process saying, well, you got to do a petition, you got to do a response, you got to serve them, you got to exchange documents, you got to do all this stuff. A lot of those steps can be uh, skipped. If you have a full agreement because you sat down at your kitchen table and came up with an agreement and it doesn't have to be a kitchen table, it could be at a Walmart or uh, you know whatever you want to do, but you came to an agreement, um, all you really need is a petition and the other opening documents that come with it and a general judgment that spells out the terms of that agreement. Um, I should say there's a, 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 a declaration that you have to file that says, yeah, I live in Oregon the last six months and, you know, provide some basic background information uh, that says, you know, basically we're entitled to a divorce. It's called a prima facie declaration. But if you guys come up with a full agreement, uh, you can do what's called a kitchen table divorce. Uh, that could be as simple as going to one of the court's websites and pulling the appropriate paperwork and filling it out and filing it yourselves. Uh, in those circumstances, I would still suggest that it might be worth the money to have them reviewed by an attorney. Uh, I, I've done it plenty of times. Somebody comes in, they wanna pay for half an hour for me to review their documents. Um, and sometimes there's a lot of things that need to be fixed and sometimes they look perfect. I say, hey, go ahead, file it. Um, that is the cheapest way. You don't have to meet with an attorney, but if you want to, I would certainly recommend to make sure you're doing it right because this, these are important documents that could have tremendous impact on your life for the foreseeable future. Um, if you guys are able to come up with an agreement, but maybe it's a little more complicated than the self-help forms, uh, you know, can tolerate, or maybe it, um, uh, you know, requires a, an extended parenting plan or something like that. Uh, you might work with an attorney that is going to prepare all those documents for you. I know I do it all the time where people come to me and we say, they say, we have an agreement. We just need you to do the paperwork. Uh, that is a little more expensive than doing the paperwork yourself, but it is a way to make sure that it is hopefully done correctly. Uh, if you're not able to agree on everything, but you think you might be able to sit down and work it all out, then you can go to mediation, which we kind of already talked about. Again, you know, you would be paying a mediator. You could also have an attorney uh, or, or, or not, um, but, you know, pay a mediator, pay your attorney, sit down, see if you can figure it out. Um, it's a lot cheaper than having to go through a full trial. Sometimes you don't necessarily have to go through the whole discovery process because everybody knows like, oh, well, I don't really want any interest in his, his El Camino or whatever. So um, mediation can save you time head, uh, and energy and, and headache. Um, but if you're not able to work it all out, the most expensive way is to go through that whole process that we just talked about, which is the litigation path. Um, admittedly, uh, if you get down that litigation path, you're probably going to end up, uh, you know, if you're working with an attorney who's trying to help you get your case resolved, you're probably going to start leaning towards these settlement options. So it's not like you commit to the litigation uh, stream. You're you're definitely going to a trial because, you know, attorneys uh, are oftentimes trying to work things out if they can. Um, so that's this cost spectrum. Um I wanted to try to get through some of the uh, issues, but, you know, I'm going to not get too deep into the weeds here because you can probably tell I can talk about things for a really long time. Um, in a divorce, there are a number of potential issues. The biggest one oftentimes is dividing your assets and liabilities. I guess that depends on how many assets and liabilities you have, um, but it can be time consuming. Um, 
all the assets and liabilities need to be disclosed. This includes real property, bank accounts, everything that I have listed there, but that's not everything. Um, for all your assets, uh, we basically put everything into a big pool. And we say, we're going to start by presuming that everybody contributed equally to the acquisition of all of these items. Uh, that's what's called the presumption of equal contribution. Now it is just a presumption. You can rebut that presumption by showing, well, they didn't contribute equally because I owned this before we were married, or they didn't contribute equally because, um, you know, my great aunt Bertha died and just left it to me. I didn't even do anything other than exist to, to earn it. Um, there are a number of ways you can rebut that presumption of equal contribution, but it is a starting point. And I would say that rebutting that presumption of equal contribution, you're not going to be looking at it and saying, well, I'm the one that went out and earned all the money. Or you're not going to be saying, I'm the one that, uh, you, you know, uh, you was the one that paid the, the mortgage payment every month. The court isn't going to get into that. They're not going to necessarily put a bunch of value on, um, you know, saying that being the one that went out and earned all the money to pay for the house was more important than the one being the person that was there taking care of the house while the other person was out there earning all the money. So uh, it's just kind of a heads up that, you know, um, you can rebut the presumption, but it's not as is not as nuanced as saying, well, I'm the one that took the trash out every Tuesday or, or whatever. It, it, it's it, we're talking broader uh, things like like somebody had it before they were married or uh, it was an inheritance or something of that nature. Uh, with that presumption of equal contribution, you, you may hear people say that we just want to divide everything 50-50. That's great if that's what you want to do. Uh, I found that it is oftentimes very hard to divide everything exactly 50-50 because bank account values change, retirement account values change. Uh, there may be a disagreement on the value of the house. Um, there may be some debts that someone wants to keep and it just doesn't make sense to try to transfer it or whatever. Um, and a court, if they're looking at it, they're not looking at it saying, we're going to just divide everything 50-50. Their legal guidance is to do what is called a just and equitable division of assets and liability. And that is a lot of gray area for a court to do what they think is just and equitable under the circumstances. So um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be 50 50 and people should be aware of that because it's oftentimes misleading um generally that's what we're we may be aiming for but it doesn't always work out perfect uh okay another issue uh that people are oftentimes want to talk about uh is spousal support uh, it's also known as alimony by some people um but this is exactly what it sounds like support for your former spouse there are three types of spousal support. Uh, they're listed there, compensatory, trans transitional, and maintenance. They each have their own purposes. Compensatory is to compensate somebody for something. Transitional is to allow somebody to transition from one uh, you know, lifestyle to another. And usually that means going back to school or uh, you know, something where they're re-entering the workforce. And maintenance is the most common one where you're talking about, well, there's a disparity between the party's income and we need to make up for that somehow so that one spouse can maintain uh, the lifestyle that they were enjoying before. And it's, it's not going to be perfect, but we try to make sure both sides maintain uh, a lifestyle that's somewhat similar. Uh, spousal support isn't available in every case. There's a lot of factors that a court will consider. Um, I've just listed three, but it really does depend on the type of support. The big issues are the length of the marriage, everybody's financial resources, and the monthly living expenses of both parties. That isn't to say that, you know, if you say, well, I need, you know, $14,000 a month for food, a court is going to say, oh, well, it must be $14,000 a month of spousal support. It's, uh, you know, just a factor. And it's not like child support. There are There isn't a spousal support calculator, and there are no bright line rules that a court must follow. Uh, and sometimes they will get creative and say, well, I'm not going to give you as much spousal support because I'm going to give you more of the assets because I think that's what's just and equitable. Um, so just so you know about spousal support, it is a little more complicated than child support, which I'll try to talk about here in a second. Uh, another potential is issue is custody. Um, I, will, I really try to drive home to people that custody is not 
what some people seem to think it is. It's not a reflection of how often you will see your kids. And it is not permission to just control the other per parent's relationship with the child. What it is, it is the legal responsibility for the child. With that responsibility comes certain rights. The big ones that we talk about are the right to, uh, if you are legally responsible for making sure that they get to school, you uh, end up uh, with the right to decide where they go to school. Um, that isn't like an absolute right, but you know, it's kind of push comes to shove. Whoever has custody gets to make the decision. If you're arguing about two equally good schools, you know, whoever has custody may be the one making that decision. Um, and the other thing we talk about, uh, you know, custody being is giving you the right to make medical decisions for your child. Um, so that hopefully clarifies custody a little bit uh, because oftentimes people will come in and they will say, I need sole custody, I need joint custody, and I need sole custody, I need whatever, you know, whatever they want. And really what they're talking about is parenting time. Um, another thing about custody, if you want to do joint custody, you can, but both parties have to agree to joint custody. It, if one parent says, I don't want to do joint custody, a court will have to pick somebody. Um, they don't have to have a good reason. They just have to not want to do joint custody. Okay. Uh, if a court has to decide custody, these are the factors that it, or some of the factors that it will look at. The biggest one is usually who's been the primary parent. Um, that may be who's the one that spends more time with them, who's the one that takes them to doctor's appointments, who's the one that signs them up for activities, takes them to activities, participates in those activities. Um, I think the second most important one is which parent uh, or, or how willing is each parent to facilitate a relationship between the child and the other parent. Um, I think that can, you know, go a long way in court size. So it's something to consider. But again, I think primary parents, are the biggest factor, but willingness to facilitate a relationship is also an important factor the court will consider. Hopefully both sides have an interest and, an, and a good attitude toward their child because it is something the court will be looking at. Um, desirability of continuing an existing relationship. Uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit in parenting time if I could get there, but um, that is... Um, you know, something that courts are going to be look at. Do we really want this child spending time with the other parent? Um, there's also if one parent abused the other and if there are additional family members uh, in the one parent's orbit that the court really wants to make sure the child still has available. To them. So again, custody uh, is different from parenting time. You may end up with full custody, but the other side would still have a right to request parenting time. Uh, parenting time takes the form of a parenting plan. And usually it's broken down into what is the regular parenting time schedule or the regular parenting plan. And then what do we do on holidays? It can include other things like exchanges and how they're going to be handled and who's going to be transporting the children uh, to and from. Um, but it could also include like a specific communication schedule like, OK, you know, kids get to call their parents, you know, every day at five or, you know, whatever, you know, either the court orders or the parties agree to. Um, there's also oftentimes a lot of extra language in there about, you know, um, not disparaging the other parent, uh, about, you know, whether you're going to introduce new partners and pretty much anything that either the court thinks is important or the parties agree is important and they want to make sure it's part of their parenting plan. Um, factors in determining a parenting plan. Again, they're pretty much the same issues that are in custody. But you also have to look at the age of the child. You have to look at the child's schedule of parenting time with the other parent. Are there any safety concerns because one parent is, is a drug addict or, or they have mental health issues or something? Are there logistical concerns? Like, is this parent really going to be able to drive a 10-year-old uh, 45 minutes to get to school every morning? Uh, and then sometimes we look at the child's desires. You know, that's where you might be looking at having a child's attorney or something like that. What I was going to say about parenting time, though, uh, the the law in Oregon is such that the um, courts are tasked with making sure that parents have, or children rather, have as much contact with both parents as possible, as is safe, and as reasonable. That's a way of saying that courts in Oregon are generally trying to make sure that kids can see both parents, okay? So... If you ever hear somebody say, like, I'm going to get full custody of the kids and you're never going to see them again. 
well, maybe you did something really bad and, and, and that may justify them saying that. Uh, or maybe they're just saying it because they're trying to scare you because the reality is, even if you do not have full custody, that is not a reason why you wouldn't necessarily have uh, a, a robust parenting plan. It is entirely reasonable to not have any custody of your kids, but to have a 50-50 parenting plan where you see them all the time. Um, child support is another issue that comes up a lot, you know, only if you have kids, obviously, but uh, there is a calculator online where we list, uh, we input all of these factors that are on the screen. Income, if somebody's paying spousal support, if they pay union dues, uh, if how the number of overnight visits each parent has with the child or children, if there are child care costs, everything that's listed there, you put it in this calculator and it spits it out and it tells you, here's how much you would be paying in child support. It is really just a guideline. You don't have to follow that if you don't want to. Uh, a lot of people will deviate for it for one reason or another. Um, but if push comes to shove, you know, that's what the court will use to figure out child support. It's different from spousal support where there's a lot of nuance and argument about, well, you know, do they really have to pay that much for rent or whatever. It's not like that in child support. These are the factors that a court will consider. You can rebut it. Um, there, there are rebuttal factors but they are for extraordinary expenses. I mean, there are other ones and you can research them or talk to an attorney about them if you wanna get into them. Um, but just know that generally we're gonna be following that kite calculator uh, unless there's some reason not to. Um, then I always like to think of what, I call, call them hidden costs and expenses because they're the kinds of things that kind of sneak up and people forget to talk about with their attorney or their attorney forgets to talk about with them. If you have to do a a qualified domestic relations order to divide a retirement account. You have to use a quadro attorney most likely, and that has a cost that comes with it. Usually it's split equally by the parties, but maybe it's not. Uh, it is one of those things that I consider to be like a hidden cost. Life insurance is one thing that we oftentimes forget about. If you have a spousal support or child support obligation, the court may order you to maintain a life insurance policy listing the other parent as the beneficiary to secure that obligation. Basically, if you say you owe $200,000 worth of spousal support and child support over the next 20 years or whatever, the court may say, you need to maintain a life insurance policy so that if you die, we know that there will be money to cover that obligation. Um, not always, but usually it's out there. Unreimbursed medical expenses for children is another one of those hidden costs and things that sometimes doesn't get talked about. Um, you know, because it's not always just, you know, the insurance covers everything, right? It doesn't always work out that way. There's co-pays, there's, uh, you know, uncovered costs, and uh, the court will do any number of ways of that they will divide it. A lot of times it's just we divide them equally, but sometimes it's, well, we look at everybody's income and we divide, divide it based on that. And then the last one that I threw in here was extracurricular activities for the children, because that's another one of those things that is not covered by child support. Um, and it may be added if um, your kids do a bunch of activities or the court thinks that they should be allowed to do activities. Um, anyway, so those are, you know, one of the other potential issues. And I'm sure that I'm not covering every little possible thing that could happen. This is just intended to be an overview. Um, the other thing I will say, Modifications, uh, it is a, a reality of divorce. There are certain things that can be modified um, and they each have their own level of difficulty for modifying them. Custody can be modified. It, it's a lot harder than modifying parenting time, but it can be modified. So if you don't have full custody now, um, you, you could end up with it depending on what happens in the future. Um, if you have uh, joint custody, you might have to modify it to make it sole custody. Uh, parenting time can be modified. It's easier to modify than custody, um, but there, you know, it's out there. It's a possibility because kids grow up, life happens, um, and you're, it's not like you're stuck with the parenting plan that you have for the rest of your life. Um, child support can be modified. It's actually, you're allowed to modify it by rule every three years, but if somebody is lost a job or they've gotten a better paying job or, you know, somebody gave birth to a child or spousal support ended, you could end up modifying child support. Spousal support can also be modified. 
Uh, it's very complicated, and um, I don't want to get into all the nuances of it, but just know that it is out there. It is not as simple as, hey, they got remarried. My spousal support obligation ended. Uh, there's more to it than that. But that's an example of when you might be looking at possibly modifying spousal support. Assets and liabilities, just the distribution of them uh, usually is not modified. But sometimes things happen, like people didn't share all the information that they were supposed to. In that case, the court might reopen it uh, and, and modify it. It's not terribly common, uh, but it does happen. So, um, you know, it, it, it's not going to be a situation where like, well, I just don't think it's fair. Let's modify it. That's not going to be a reason. But, you know, um, there may be reasons why that a, a, a court would modify it. So you should be aware of that. Um, so I, I left this slide saying if you have any questions, um, I lost the little thing that said where the Q&A was. Uh, there it is. So I don't know if people have questions. I'm happy to try to answer them now if they want to put them into the Q&A or, or if, if, Amy, if there's some other way to do it. If not, you can always contact me at, uh, at Sean's Fanning PC. That's our website and our phone number. Um, you know, we, assuming I don't have any conflict, I would be happy to set up a time to talk with anybody, um, and answer any questions you have about your specific case. But, um, yeah, Amy, if there's no questions or there's no way to ask those questions now, I'll just move on to the uh, next slide and just say thank you for having me. Uh, I hope it's been informative for, uh, everybody who's listening or sees this someday. Um, because, you know, like I said at the beginning, uh, this whole process can be a real mystery. And I've seen people that have spent months, years, long periods of time, decades even, uh, avoiding a divorce because they're scared of what it actually means. So hopefully this sheds some light on it to, uh, you know, disinfect that a little bit and hopefully um, give enough information that people are feeling a little bit better about. It. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Chris, um, for all that valuable information. Um, so the Q&A is open. Um, also, if some people have questions, if you raise your hand, I can unmute you. Um, while we're seeing if there's any questions, I just want to say thank you for everyone for joining us tonight. Um, as you see on the screen, our next legal information program will be on October 25th and will be about... Um, what to do when you're when a loved one can no longer care for themselves um so i don't see anybody raise oh let's see we've got a raised hand so i am going to do a stop rec uh recording um and we can answer questions sure